This video is brought to you by ThePuzzler.com. This is session number two of the Puzzler's AMC 10 course. We'll be looking at number theory on the AMC 10 in today's session. In today's class, we'll be trying to get through as many number theory topics that appear on the AMC 10 as possible. We'll be looking at the Euclidean algorithm, modular arithmetic basics and properties, the Euler's totient function, the Chinese remainder theorem, unit cycles, the number of divisors that a number has, Legendary's formula, and the relationship between LCM and GCD. We'll also be looking at the chicken McNugget theorem. Let's get started. Let's start off with the most basic topic for number theory on the AMC 10, factors and multiples. But this isn't just gonna be simply basic, we're also gonna include some complex concepts in this. So to find the number of divisors of a composite number n, you take the prime factorization of that number. So let's say we have n, the prime factorization of n is p1 to the power of a1 times p2 to the power of a2, and so on, where p, p1, p2, all the way to pk, they're all different prime numbers, and the a's just represent their powers. So the number of divisors of n is equal to a1 plus 1 times a2 plus 1 times all the way to ak plus 1. So you just add 1 to all the exponents and just multiply the exponents. We won't prove these in class today just because of time constraints, but it would be a good exercise if you haven't already to try and prove these formulas to see why they work. So getting a bit more complex, Euler's totient theorem. This tells us how many numbers are relatively prime to some number n. And they use this symbol that's called the phi symbol, but you don't really need to know the notation. And basically, the Euler's totient function, it tells us, or the Euler's totient theorem, it tells us that um, phi of n is equal to n times 1 minus 1 over p1 times 1 minus 1 over p2 all the way to 1 minus 1 over pk, where p1, p2, all the way to pk are just the prime factors, the distinct prime factors of the number n. So these formulas are all fine and all, but let's look at an actual example to, to see what I'm talking about. How many positive factors does the number 72 have? Well, the first thing you have to do for questions like this is take the prime factorization of 72. 72 is equal to two times, so now we're left with 36, so another two, then we're left with 18, so then another two, and then we're left with nine, which is three times three times three. Double checking our work, we have two times two times two, which is eight, times three times three, which is nine. So eight times nine, that does give us 72. So this is equal to two cubed, times three squared. So the number of factors, positive factors that 72 has, we just add one to the exponents and multiply. Or 12 factors. So we have 12 factors in 72. Okay, what else is the problem asking? How many how many numbers from one to 72 inclusive are relatively prime to 72? So that is gonna be this Euler totient function. We have to take phi of n and use our formula to figure that out. Okay, so phi of 72 is gonna be equal to 72, so the number itself, times one minus all the distinct prime factors, um, one over the distinct prime factors, so one over two, times one minus one over three. And this gives us 72 times one half times two thirds. These cancel to give us 24 numbers that are relatively prime to 72. Remember, a relatively prime number is just a number that when you take the greatest common denominator, greatest common factor of 72, and another number, it's going to give us one if the numbers are relatively prime. Okay, what else is the problem asking? What is the sum of the positive factors of 72? So we didn't go over this in the formula section because this doesn't appear that much on the AMC 10, uh, but it is still quite an important technique, especially if you want to go ahead of AMC 10 and excel on the AMI. To find the sum of the factors of a number, first you find the prime factorization. We already know that 72 is equal to two cubed times three squared. And then you take each of the primes 
and you start with that prime to the power of zero, which is always one, then that prime to the power of one, so P one to the power of one, then P one to the power of two, all the way to P one to the power of K, where K is just like the power of the exponent in the actual prime factorization. And then we repeat that here for the next exponent. So we have P um, one plus P two, to the power of 1 plus p2 to the power of 2 all the way to p2 to the power of k2. Okay, so that's what you would keep on doing. So let's do that for 72. For 72, we have 1 since it's 2 cubed. So 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 since 8 is 2 cubed. And then for 3 squared, it would be 1 plus 3 plus 9. This gives us 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 4 is 7, 7 plus 8 is 15, times 1 plus 3, which is 4, plus 9, which is 13. 15 times 13, that's 14 squared minus 1 if you use difference of squares. So that would give us 195, because 150 plus 45 gives us 195. So the sum of the factors of 72, the positive factors, is 195. But what if you don't believe me? Let's double check our answer. Let's find the factors of 72. We have 1 and 72. We have 2 and 36. We have 3 and 24. 4 and 18. 6 and 12. Then 7 is not a factor. 8. Is eight, in, is 8 a factor? Yep, it is 8 and 9, and then 9 and 8. But 9 and 8, we already covered that here. So now we're just doing the same factors, but reverse. So we just stop here. Okay. So 72 plus 36 gives us 108. Plus 24 gives us 132. Plus 18 plus 12. 18 plus 12 is 30. So we can do that together. So that gives us 162 plus nine gives us 171. Then plus these four numbers is 10, 181, and then plus six plus eight, which is 14. That gives us 195. So sure enough, our answer matches what we got using our formula. Let's look at an AMC problem involving this concept. Now, one thing worth mentioning before we start with our AMC problems is that today we'll be moving a bit faster through the problems because there's a lot of content that we want to cover in the time that we have. So if you don't catch all the stuff today, that's fine. We would really suggest just re-watching the video, re-watching the parts you're not sure about, and if you have any questions, asking us those questions. But without further ado, let's get started with the AMC problems. So from the 2020 AMC 10A, a single bench section at a school event can hold either seven adults or 11 children. When N bench sections are connected to end to end, an equal number of adults and children seated together will occupy all the bench space. What is the least possible positive integer value of n? So here, seven adults or 11 children, right? And when n bench sections are connected to end to end, an equal number of adults and children seated together will occupy all the bench space. So there's going to be some sort of a LCM part involved here. But what does that mean? Let's see. There's an equal number of adults and an equal number of children. So let's call the total number of adults 7a, where a is an integer, and the total number of children as 11c. Well, a and c are both integers. So if we make a equal to 11 and c equal to 7, that's the least amount it'll work. And that's because the LCM of 7 and 11 is 77. So 77 is the smallest number that is both divisible by 7 and 11. Smallest positive number that's divisible by both 7 and 11. So what does that mean? Well, when n bench sections are connected end to end, there's an equal number of children in each seat. So you need 11 seats for the adults, and then you need 7 seats for the children. That would give us 18. So let's move on. So there's 77 adults, 77 children, which gives us 18 seats in total. For how many not necessarily positive integer values of n is the value of 
4,000 times 2 over 5 to the power of n, an integer. Well, this is going to be, say n is positive, then we're dividing by some power of 5. What's going to be positive, it's going to be an integer as long as that power of 5 is a factor of 4,000. So what is the prime factorization of 4,000? Well, 4,000 equals 4 times 1,000. So that's 2 squared times 1,000 is equal to 2 cubed times 5 cubed, which gives us 2 to the power of 5 times 5 cubed. Just checking my answer, that's 16, 32, 32 times 125. Yep, that looks correct because 125 times 8 gives us 1,000. So if this number right here is 1, 2, or 3, we're going to be dividing, we're going to be multiplying by 2 to some power, which is fine. That's not going to change anything. But we're dividing by 5 to the power of 1, 2, or 3. We can do that because we have that in the prime factorization of 4,000. So those powers of 5 will just cancel out. If you do 5 to the power of 4, though, well, the 5 cubed powers cancel out. And then you're doing 2 to the some power divided by 5, which is not going to give us an integer. So for positive values, 1, 2, and 3 work. Is that our answer? Well, let's reread the question. For how many integer values not necessarily positive? So negative values also count. Well, you could have n to the power of 0, in which case 2, to, or 2 over 5 to the power of 0. Or we could have n equals 0, in which case 2 over 5 to the power of 0 just equals 1, which is going to give us an integer. So you could have 0. And if we reverse it, what happens? Well, reversing it is going to give us 4,000. By reversing it, I mean negative ends. That's going to give us 4,000 times 5 over 2 to the power of n. So this is the same problem as here, but instead of dividing by powers of 5, we're dividing by powers of 2. And the exponent of 2 is 5. So you could have anywhere from negative 5 to negative 1. So negative 5 to negative 1, that's 5 numbers, plus 0 is that number, and then plus three positive numbers. So that would give us nine as our total answer. Let's move on. 2016 AMC 10A. How many ways are there to write 2016 as the sum of twos and threes, ignoring order? For example, 1008 times two plus zero times three, and 402 times two plus 404 times three are two such ways. Hmm. Well, first of all, just to see what we're dealing with, is 2016 divisible by 2? Well, yes, it is, because the last digit is 6. And then is it divisible by 3? Well, to be divisible by 3, you just add up the digits, which is 9. Is 9 divisible by 3? Yes. So we know that 2016 is divisible by both 2s and 3s. So let's play around with the problem. They tell us that 1008 times 2 plus 0 times 3 equals 2NE16. Now, what if I lower this one power? I mean one number, so 1007 times 2, and then something times 3 equals 2016. So what I just did is I subtracted 2, right? I subtracted 2 because 1008 times 2 is 2 greater than 1007 times 2. I subtracted 2, but 2 is not a multiple of 3, so I can't really make this 1, and fractions are not allowed. Uh, because then this is not equal to 2016, it's equal to 2017. So now I sort of get how to deal with this problem. I want to subtract some number of twos such that I can add in some number of threes for it to balance out. And that's going to happen when you subtract the LCM of two and three, which is six. So if we subtract six, which is three twos, let's make this 1005. Well, now we've subtracted six here. So we need to add 6 to the other term, so that equals 2016. So to add 6 to the 3s, this is going to become 2. And we can keep on going. 1002 times 2 plus 4 times 3. Let's just double check our answer. 2004 plus 12. Yep, that's 2016. All the way to 0 times 2 plus now, if we get some integer here, we should because it's divisible by 3, but we have to double check. So 2016 divided by 3, that would give us 20 divided by 3 gives us 6. 
21 divided by 3 gives us 7, 6 divided by 3 gives us 2. So we have 67, 672, so 1800, and then plus 70, which is 2010, plus 2. So 672 times 3. And that gives us 2016. Okay, so our answer is not 1008 though. There's 1008 as the maximum coefficient of the two, but it can go, it goes down by threes. So how many numbers from zero to 1008 where we're counting by, where we're counting by threes? Well, to find that, let's first add three to all the terms in this list. And if you watched our video on our channel about counting numbers in lists, you'll know how to do this type of problem. So if you add three to each number in the list, it'll become three, six, nine, all the way to 1,011. And now we can divide by three, each divide each term by three, that would become one, two, three, all the way to 1,011 divided by three, which is three. Um, you'd have one, one left over, so that would be three, 337. So, how many numbers are there from 1 to 337? Well, that's just 337. So there's 337 ways that we can write 2016 like this. Let's move on to the next problem. Let's try this problem from the 2018 AMC 10B. Joey and Chloe and their daughter Zoe all have the same birthday. Joey is one year older than Chloe and Zoe is exactly one year old today. Today is the first of the nine birthdays on which Chloe's age will be an integral multiple of Zoe's age. What will be the sum of the two digits of Joey's age the next time his age is an integer multiple of Zoe's age? Okay, a lot of information in this problem. Let's make it into variables. So we're given that Joey is one year older than Chloe. So J, let's put J is equal to Chloe plus one. And we're given that Zoe is equal to one right now. And today's the first of the nine birthdays on which Chloe's age will be an integral multi multiple of Zoe's age. Okay, so that's always true, right? Chloe, because all numbers are multiples of one. But let's say n years from now, n years from now, what will be the age of Chloe and Zoe? n years from now, Chloe is gonna be C plus n, so n plus C. And Zoe is going to be 1 plus n. And this number right here, for nine different values of n, it's going to equal an integer. Or if you exclude today, uh, so that n is greater than or equal to greater than or equal to 1, there's at least eight different values of n that make this into an integer. So we can subtract n plus 1 from both the top and the bottom. Uh, from the top, right? We can subtract n plus 1 and rewrite the fraction as this. So 1 plus and then c minus 1 over n plus 1. So this is the same exact thing. And you can expand this and take common denominators to check that out. But OK, so now c minus 1 over n plus 1 has to give us uh, integer value. So when does that happen? Well, we have to find the value of C that will make this happen. This is basically finding C minus one. So C minus one has at least eight different factors, right? It's asking for at least eight different factors of C minus one. Now those eight different factors that means that C minus one is of the form P to the power of seven or, or C minus one should have, let's say nine factors. It should have at least nine factors. So it has at least nine factors because we can't have, um, an equaling zero, right? So C minus one has at least nine factors. So then we have that C minus one is either equal to some prime to the power of eight, because that would give us nine factors or it's equal to p1 cubed and then p2 cubed because that would also or not cubed but squared because if we square this 
this number right here is three times three or nine factors. So no number to the power of one to eight. So you have to remember the context of the problem, right? Uh, the problem, they're human. So no two digit number. Does it tell us if they're two digit numbers? Okay, so it does tell us that. What will be the sum of the two digits of Joey's age? Um, so yeah, we're working with two digits here or possibly like one digit for Zoe. Um, but we're not working with three digit numbers. So there's no two digit or one digit number that is equal to like the eighth power of a number except for one. So this can't really be true. This is possible though. We could have two squared times three squared, which is 36. So if C minus one equals 36, then C would equal 37. Uh, so 36 has at least nine different factors, positive factors. So that would be a valid value. So Chloe is equal to 37. Chloe is equal to 37 when Z is equal to one. J is thus equal to C plus one, so 38. So we have that 38 plus so Joey is equal to 38. What is the problem asking next? Let's go back to the problem. It's asking what is the sum of the two digits of Joey's age the next time his age is a multiple of Zoe's age? Okay, so we have that after n years, 38, let's say k years, let's use the different variables. Uh, 38 plus k over 1 plus k, this should give us an integer 2. Well, when is this going to give us an integer? Well, the difference between the top and the bottom is 37 right? Because 38 plus K minus one minus K gives us 37. So if the bottom right here is 37, then this top right here is going to equal 37 plus 37. So this would be two times 37. So this would give us an integer. So for K plus one to equal 37, K is equal to 36. So we have one plus 36 over 38 plus K, right? So K is equal to 36. So what does that mean for the context of this problem? Well, it means that we could have the bottom equal one plus 37, right? So, or one plus 36, so it equals 37. And then the top equals 38 plus K. So 38 plus 36. So let's write that here. 38 plus 36. And 38 plus 36, that gives us 37 times two, which is 60 plus 14. So 74 over 37. So this is equal to two. So that means that Joey is going to equal is going to be 74 years old when his daughter is going to be 37 years old and that would be the next the time his age is a multiple of Zoe's age. So the sum of 7 plus 4 is 11 and we can move on to the next problem. This is a problem from the 2012 Amy 1. Find the number of positive integers with three not necessarily distinct integers a b and c with a not equaling zero and c not equaling zero such that both a b c and c b a are multiples of four well what is a multiple of four a multiple of four means that a number the last two digits of the number are divisible by four so instead of a b c having to be divisible by four just b c has to be divisible by four and b c is not b times c this is 10 b plus c over four so these are like this is a two digit number. So that's what it means. Well, the two numbers that we need to be divisible by four then are BC and BA. Hmm. If B is equal to zero, then C can either equal four or eight since it's not allowed to equal zero. If B equals one, then C can equal, well, 12 is divisible by four and so is 16, but that's it. So there's two choices. What about two? Well, 24, 28, those are the only two that work. And now we notice the pattern. For even numbers, it's four and eight. For odd numbers, it's two and six. So odd values of B, you can only have two and six for the units digit. And for even values of B, you can have four or eight. So that means that for any B value that we pick, there's two choices that we can have here. And then when we flip the number, there's two choices that we could have here. There's 10 ways to pick the value of B and four choices for each value. So our answer for this Amy problem is just 40 and we're done.
due to time constraints in today's class, we won't be looking at the rest of the factors and multiples problems, but you'll find them in the puzzler homework section for today's class. Let's move on to the next topic, the chicken McNugget theorem, which states that for any two relatively prime positive integers m and n, the greatest integer that cannot be written in the form am plus bn for non-negative integers a and b is m times n minus m minus n. What does that mean? Well, it's saying that if you have, say, a company that only sells donuts in boxes of three and five, then the number of maximum number of donuts that you cannot buy is equal to three times five. So let's write that here. Three times five, which is 15. And then 15 minus three minus five. So eight donuts, right? So, or, 15 minus 3 minus 5, so 7 donuts. So the maximum number of donuts that you can't buy would be 7. Anything above 7, you can buy. Let's look at an AMC 10 problem using this concept. 2015 AMC 10B. The town of Hamlet has 3 people for each horse, 4 sheep for each cow, and 3 ducks for each person. Which of the following could not possibly be the total number of people, horses, sheep, cows, and ducks in Hamlet? Okay, so right here, we're given some information and let's try to convert this information to minimize the number of creatures or types of creatures that we have. So the town of Hamlet has three people for each horse. So that means that if there's one horse, there's going to be three people. So people is equal to three times horses, four sheep for each cow. So uh, if there's a cow, one cow, there's gonna be four sheep for that cow. So S for sheep is equal to four cows. Three ducks for each person. So the number of ducks is equal to three times the number of people. Which of the following could not possibly be the total number? So let's convert, first of all, this is just a separate equation that we have, but let's convert this P and D into terms of horses. So the number of people is three H, the number of horses is h, and the number of ducks is 3 times 3h, three or 9h. So this gives us 13 horses. And then the number of cows is equal to c, and the number of sheep is equal to 4c. So we're given 5c total here. So our answer is of the form 13h plus 5c. Well, which of these numbers cannot be expressed like this? So it's a multiple choice test. You can try out each of the choices and see. But we just learned about the chicken McNugget theorem. Let's plug it, plug 13 and 5 into the chicken McNugget theorem. 13 times 5 minus 13 minus 5. Which gives us an answer of 65 minus 13, which is 52, minus 5, which gives us 47. So our answer is 47. Let's move on. Consecutive integers is our next topic. And there's not really any theory here. We'll learn more about this doing the problems. What is the greatest number of consecutive integers whose sum is 45? Well, that would be, let's see, we could have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. That's 15 plus 6. That's 21 plus 7. That's 28. Almost there. Plus 8. That's 36 or plus eight would give us 36, plus nine. So that's nine. So I would just say that answer is nine. But let's just reread the problem to make sure what we're doing is correct. What is the greatest number of consecutive integers whose sum is 45? Well, it's asking for consecutive integers. I just started with one and I went all the way to nine. That's positive numbers only. It's possible that we have negative numbers too. So if we have negative numbers, that might be an even higher answer. And granted that this is the lowest choice, there's probably a chance that the answer is even higher, although not 100%, but there's probably a chance. So let's see, let's think about this problem. Well, you have some negative numbers and then some positive numbers, right? So you're gonna have negative numbers x negative numbers, 0, then you're going to have x positive numbers, 
and then you're going to have some leftover positive numbers. And these x negative numbers will cancel out with these x positive numbers because negative 1 cancels out with positive 1, negative 2 cancels out with positive 2, negative 3 cancels out with positive 3, and so on. And then you have these numbers right here. Well, to maximize this, you want to maximize the number of numbers that are canceling out. So what if we have like all the numbers cancel out? So let's say x is equal to 44. Well, then we go from negative 44 to negative 43, all the way to 43, comma 44, and then 45. So these numbers cancel out with the negative counterparts and we're just left with 45. And this is the maximum solution that we can obtain. So our answer, well, that's just equal to, there's uh, 44 negative numbers, zero, 45 positive numbers, so 90 total numbers. Let's move on. Our next topic for today is palindromes. So here's a problem from the 2020 AMC 10B to start us along. Driving along a highway, Megan noticed that her autometer showed 15951 miles. This number is a palindrome because it reads the same forwards and backwards. Then two hours later, the autometer displayed the next higher palindrome. What was her average speed, or speed in miles per hour during this two hour period? Well, what is the next palindrome? Well, to get the next palindrome, uh, you want to increase the digit that's like the innermost digit. So if we had 1, 5, now 10, 5, 1, and this was the next palindrome, this would work. Because if you instead decide to increase the 5, then you'd have to increase this 5, which causes a bigger increase. But 1, 5, 10, 5, 1 is unfortunately not a number. So we have to go into the 1600s. So we have to increase the next number out here. And that would be 1, 6, 0, 6, 1. Right? We can't have anything less than this. So our next one would be 1, 6, 0, 6, 1. Subtract 1, 5, 9, 5, 1 from this. That would give us 0, 1, 160 minus 159 is 1, 1, 0. So 1, 1, 0 divided by 2 hours. That gives us 55 as our answer. That's easy. Let's look at a harder example. A palindrome such as 83438 is a number that remains the same when its digits are reversed. The numbers x and x plus 32 are three digits and four digit palindromes, respectively. What is the sum of the digits of x? So we're only adding 32 from this three digit number to get the four digit number. So it's not going to be too high. How many three digit palindromes are there that are that when added 32 to them, you'll get a four digit number? Well, there's 999, 989, 979, 969, and that's it. If you add 32 to 959, that doesn't really give you any output. So let's start with the 969. So 969, if we add 32, we get 1, 0, 0, and 1001. Oh, wait a second. That's a palindrome. So we're done. We started out with 969 and that gives us a palindrome. But yeah, if you started out with the 999 first, there's only four numbers to try out and you'd find your answer. So they're asking for the sum of the digits of X. So this is X. So this is 18 plus six or 24. Okay, let's move on. Bases. So bases are quite a very important topic on the AMC 10 and basically Let's take a look at what they are. So right here, we have a problem about bases to start us off. So in base 10, the number 2013 ends in the digit three. In base nine, on the other hand, the same number is written as 2676 base nine, and it ends in the digit six. For how many positive integers B does the base B representation of 2013 end in the digit three? So we're assuming that you know what bases are, and if you don't know what those are, we have a video for that on our channel or in our introduction to number theory course that we'd highly suggest you check out before uh, trying to understand this part of the video. Okay, so we have that in base 10, the number 2013 ends in the digit three. Okay, that's true because it does. This is base 10, that's the base we usually use. But in base nine, on the other hand, the same number written as 2676, well, it's ending in the digit six. 
For how many positive integers b does the base b representation of 2013 end in the digit 3? So if you remember the definition of bases, it's if you have a number in base b, a, uh, let's say a1, a2, a3, so on, to ak, well then this number in base b, this is just equal to ak plus ak minus 1 times b plus ak minus 2 times b squared all the way to the end, right? So you start with b to the power of 0 for your ones digit, then b to the power of 1, then b to the power of 2, and so on. So for a number to end in the digit 3, for the 2013, when you convert it to base b, for it to end in digit 3, it's going to be some number times b, let's call that some arbitrary number x, times b, plus 3. So if, if 2013 is equal to x times b plus 3, well then when you're writing it in base b, this is going to equal, if you have that number, it's going to equal all the digits except for that last digit. And that last digit is going to equal 3. So that last digit right here is equal to 3. So what does that mean? That means that x times b plus 3 is equal to 2013, since we want the last digit to equal 3. So x times b equals 2010. So all the numbers that are factors of 2010 are valid bases b, except in the ones where 3 is not a valid digit, right? So base 1, 2, or 3 don't work. Base 1 isn't even a real thing, but base 2 or 3 don't work. But you can't have the factors being 1, 2, or 3. So that's very important here. So what does that mean? Let's take a look. So let's start by finding the prime factorization of 2010. So 2010 prime factorization, well, it's equal to 201 times 10. 201 is equal to 3 times 67, and then 10 equals 2 times 5. So we have 2 times 3 times 5 times 67 as the prime factorization. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means that if you remember from all the way in the beginning, the number of divisors of this number is equal to 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, so 16. But 1, 2, and 3 doesn't work. All other 13 possible bases are valid, so our answer is C. Let's move on to a very hard problem. We are now going to try to attempt the hardest problem of today's session. This is from the 2020 Amy number two. For each positive integer n, let f of n be the sum of the digits in the base four representation of n, and let g of n be the sum of the digits in the base eight representation of f of n. For example, f of 2020 is equal to f of 133210 in base four, which is equal to 10, in base 10, um, because if you just add up the digits, they're equal to 10, and that's equal to 12 in base 8. So that means that g of 2020 is equal to the digit sum of 12 in base 8, which is 3. So let n be the least value of n, such that the base 16 representation of g of n cannot be expressed using only the digits 0 through 9. Find the remainder when n is divided by 1000. Wow, that's a big problem. Let's draw a chart just representing our steps. So the first step is we have some number n. Let's write it here, some number n. Now, what's next? So our first step is to take n. Second step, convert, convert to base 4. So second step is to convert to base 4. Third, sum the digits. That's what we're doing sum the digits in base 4, convert sum, so then we're converting the sum to base 8 now. Now we're summing the digits again, so sum the digits again, and finally we get whatever our answer is. So this is answer, right? Not the answer that we're trying to find, just the answer of what happened. So to summarize, we take n, we convert it to base four, we sum the digits, then we convert that sum to base eight, we sum the digits again, and then we get our answer. 
or what g of that value would have equal. And we want this answer to not be and not be expressible using only the digits zero through nine in base g of n in base sixteen. Okay, so what's the smallest number? Okay, so basically there's another step actually that we could add to our table. If we convert answer to base sixteen. So answer to base sixteen is greater than or can't be expressed is I'll just write it um no so cannot be expressed cannot be expressed using only zero to nine. So sorry for the bad handwriting just just to speed things up. Okay. So can't be expressed using only zeros and nines. Well, what's the smallest number in base 16 that can't be expressed using only zeros, zero through nine? That's gonna be a base 16, or that's 10 base 10, right? So 10 in base 16, you need the letter a to represent that. So what do we have here? So this means that it's equal to 10 base 10, okay. So our answer here is 10 base 10, or that the sum of the digits is 10 base 10. So that means that the sum in, of the base eight number is 10 base 10. So the base eight number, the smallest base eight number that has a sum of 10 is three seven in base eight, because two eight and one nine don't work since eight and higher digits are not allowed in base eight. So 37 in base eight, which means that the sum of the digits is 37 in base 8 to base 10, which is 24 plus 7, or 31 base 10. So this is 31 base 10. Smallest number that has a sum of 31 in base 4 is going to be 1, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. How many 3s is that? That's 9 3s. We need 10 3s plus 1. That would give us 31. So Let's put in some commas. Okay, so this is the smallest number in base four. What is this number in base 10? Well, this number in base 10, this is equal to three times one plus four plus four squared plus all the way to, this is, this is what? A power of zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way to, four to the power of nine, and then this is just four to the power of 10. Well, this right here, using the geometric formula, is four to the power of 10 minus one over three. And if you don't know what that is, watch our video on geometric series to understand this formula better. And then we multiply by this three here, and then we're adding four to the power of 10, because it's right here. Okay, almost done. This, we can simplify this a bit. So we get two times four to the power of 10 minus one. Wait, that's a very large number. Let's go reread the problem. The last line says, find the remainder when n is divided by 1000. Oh, so we need to find the remainder of this when n is divided by 1000. Or more specifically, we need to take this mod 1000. So mod 1000. And we're going to be looking at modular arithmetic soon, but basically what this means is 2 to the power of 20, right? Because 4 to the power of 10 is 2 to the power of 20 times 2 minus 1. That's equal to 2 to the power of 21 minus 1. Okay, to convert this mod 1000, you need to know that 2 to the power of 10 equals 1024, which is equal to 24 mod 1000. That's just mod 1000 just means the remainder it leaves when divided by 1000. I'm using this notation. We'll learn about this notation soon. So 2 to the power of 21 and mod 1000 is just 24 times 24 times 2 minus 1 since 2 to the power of 10 can be replaced by 24 in mod 1000. This is 576 times 2 minus 1 or 1,000, so 1,000 plus 76, uh, 1,000 plus 70 times 2, so 1140, plus 12, minus 1. 
So that would be 152 minus 1, or our final answer, 151. So that's a very hard problem, and it's actually the hardest problem that we're doing today. So if you followed me through that, good job. If you didn't, then I would heavily suggest re-watching the video and this part of the video once class is over. But yeah, good job if you were able to follow up with me on that problem. Let's now move to our giveaway. It's giveaway time. We'll be raffling away two Wolfram Alpha notebook editions valued at $49.95 each. You can enter this giveaway by going to thepuzzler.com slash amc-10 dash course dash giveaway. The winners of the last giveaway are Rohan Shivakumar and Mike Zeng. Email us to claim your prize. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and like this video if you haven't already. That really helps us and gives us a boost in the YouTube algorithm. We'll give you about 15 more seconds to enter the giveaway. And remember, you can always enter after the class if you don't have time right now. Let us now take a quick look at the Euclidean algorithm. The Euclidean algorithm states that the GCD of a comma b is equivalent to the GCD of a comma b minus a. We're going to look at a quick example of this, and then we're not going to look at a direct problem of the Euclidean algorithm from the AMC 10 because it doesn't really show up directly, but it can be sometimes used to simplify problems. So here, to find the GCF of 1071 and 462, we can subtract 462 from 1071. So 1071 minus 462, that gives us 11 minus 2. 11 minus 2 is 9. 7 minus 6 minus 1 is 0. 609. 609 minus 4, 7, uh, 462 again is 7. And then 14. So 147. So our new problem is find the GCF of 147 and 462. So now let's subtract 147 from 462. So that would give us, we can subtract directly two multiples. It doesn't have to be one multiple. So that would be 2, 8, and then 2, 8, and then 9, 4. So we can subtract four, um, 294 from 462 to give us 8, 16 minus 10 gives us 6, 168. So what's the else? Uh, what's the GCF of 147 and 168? Well, we can subtract another multiple of 47, 147 from 168 to give us 147 and 21. Okay, now you can keep on subtracting 21 from 147 until you get 0, 21, because 20 uh, 147 is a multiple of 21. And that's it. Once one of the numbers is zero, the GCF is just equal to the other number, 21. And that's how you do that. So let's move on. Okay, so you probably know what the GCD and the LCM are by now. And if you don't, make sure you watch our other prerequisite videos on those. But there's an important relation between that, that between them that shows up on the AMC 10 quite frequently. A times B. So the two numbers that you're trying to find the GCD and LCM of. So A times B is equal to GCD of A comma B times the LCM of A and B. What does that mean? Well, if you want to find the GCF, uh, let's say the GCD of 6 comma 10. So 6 and 10. And then LCM of 6 and 10. Well, the GCD of 6 and 10 is, we know that's going to be 2 because both those numbers are divisible by two and that's like the highest number that they're both divisible by. Um, and then LCM is gonna equal, let's see the multiples of 10 are 10, 20, 30. So 30 is divisible by six. So 30 is the first LCM. And six times two is equal to two times 30, which is true. So that's just one example of this, but let's look at a problem. And this is a pretty hard problem from the 2018 AMC 10B. How many ordered pairs AB of positive integers satisfy the equation A times B plus 63 is equal to 20 times LCM A comma B, uh, the LCM of A and B plus 12 times the GCD of A and B, where GCD of A and B denotes the greatest common divisor of A and B and LCM of A comma B denotes their least common multiple. Okay, so let's say LCM of a comma b is equal to x and let's call the gcd then let's call it 
a comma b gcd of a and b is equal to y okay so what are we given in this problem right here we're given that a b well a b a times b is equal to lcm of a b times gcd of a b so that we can rewrite as x y plus 63 is equal to 20 times x plus 12 y okay let's rearrange this a bit let's write it as x y minus 20 x minus 12 y equals minus 63 and now we're going to use another concept called simon's favorite factoring trick to solve this problem so this might be new to a lot of us so here it's very important that you pay attention so we can factor this as x minus 20 or x minus 12 times y minus 20. And if you do that, look at what happens when you expand this. You get xy minus 12y minus 20x plus negative 12 times negative 20 is 320. No, 20 times 6. So that would be 120 times 2. So that's 240. And this is equal to this expression right here plus 240 so you can actually do that for terms like this you factor it and then you just have to add an exponent to both the sides i mean some constant to both the sides so here we added 240 because there's a 240 right here so we would also have to add a 240 to the other side so x minus 12 times y minus 20 is equal to 240 minus 63 which is 180 minus 3 or 177 and here's a second cool thing about simon's favorite factoring trick we know that x and y well x and y are always going to be like x minus 12 and y minus 12 since they're all integers since we're only dealing with integers they're going to be factors of 177 so what's the prime factorization of 177 also i think i miss wrote that this should be 20. so if this is 20. okay what do we have so fact uh prime factorization 177 well 177 divisible is divisible by 3 so this is equal to 5 and 27 that would be 59. so 177 equals 3 times 59 okay so the factors are 1 comma 177 and 3 comma 59. now notice that the lcm of a, the two numbers is always greater than or equal to the gcf right and going back up above that's we know that so that means that x is always greater than y if x is greater than y then logically x minus 12 is greater than y minus 20. so that means that x minus 12 is the larger factor so if x minus 12 equals 59, then y minus 20 equals 3. And if x minus 12 equals 171, y minus 20 equals 1. So that gives us that either x equals, um, x minus 12 equals 59. So x equals 71. And then y would equal 23. Or x equals 177 plus 12, which is 189. And then y equals 20 plus 1. So 20 plus 1 would just be 21. Okay, so we have two possible answers. But wait a second. If you think about it, the GCF of two numbers will... The GCF of A and B is a factor of A right because that by definition is the greatest common factor of a and b so it has to be a factor of a and a is a factor of lcm of a and b so that means that the gcf is a factor of the lcm so y needs to be a factor of x that's not true in this first case so we have 189 and 21 as our only possible answer is it possible though well yes if we set the gcf if we set b let's say let's assume that a is greater than b We'll look at the other case later, 
But if A equals B, I mean, if A is greater than B, then let's think about it. The GCF is equal to 21 and the LCM is equal to 21 times 6. Well, we can define the numbers to be that way. So B is equal to 21 and then A itself would be equal to 189. And just quickly double checking, the GCF of 189 and 21 is 21 and the LCM is 189. So this works. But B can also be less than A. So in that case, we would just flip them so that B equals 189 and A equals 21. So there's two possible answers that work. Okay, let's go back. Was that an answer choice? Yes, it is. So we can confidently circle our answer and move on. Let us now move on to modular arithmetic. When I say modular arithmetic, you should think remainder. For example, 39 mod 7, that's 4, because 39 divided by 7 gives us a remainder of 4. Or 143 mod 8, well, I know that 144 is divisible by 8. Um, so what that should prompt me to think about is that 144 is divisible by 8, so that would give a remainder of 0. One less than that would give a remainder of 7. 201 mod 3, well, that's 67, 201 divided by 3. So there's no remainder, so this is 0. And the cool thing about mods is that all numbers that leave the same remainder, mod, some number, mod 7, for example, are all equivalent in that mod. So 4, 11, 18, 25, they're all equivalent. Or 7 plus 8, 15, 23, so on. Or you could even go the other way, 0, negative 3, negative 6, negative 9. These are all equivalent. So we have some cool properties that we have with mods. So the first of these properties is that if A and B are, if A, B, C, and D and M are integers such that M is greater than 0, A is congruent to B mod M and C is congruent to D mod M, then A plus B is, con A plus C is congruent to B plus D mod M. A minus C is congruent to B minus D mod M. A times C is congruent to B times D mod M. So now mod, modular arithmetic is a very big category, but we're not gonna be looking at any problems involving modular arithmetic because there's not really anywhere where it's directly solvable using modular arithmetic. Instead, you use modular arithmetic to simplify the problem. And since we're running out of time and we need to make sure that we're covering all the topics that we wanted to today, We'll instead move to the next topic, which relates with modular arithmetics, uh, modular arithmetic, which is the Chinese remainder theorem. So the Chinese remainder theorem tells us that for any system of equations like this, like for example, x is equal to 2 mod 7 and x is equal to 3 mod 7, where the mods, the bases of the mods are relatively prime, it tells us that the there's always a unique solution up to a certain modulus. So here, when you have two mods that are relatively prime, we're gonna have a unique solution, mod 35. And let's try to find it. So the best way to do this, we won't look at any complicated formulas. The best way to do this is list them out. Two mod five, well, that's two, seven, 12, 17, 22, 27, and so on. Three mod seven, well, that's equal to three, 10, 17, Oh, 17 is on both lists because 17 is equal to 3 mod 7 and 2 mod 5. So 17 is an answer to this congruence. And so is 17 plus 35 because they don't change mod 5 or 7. So 17 plus 35, 17 plus 70, and so on. So that's what it tells us. So this solution is unique mod 35. Okay. Now, though, let's actually look at a problem that appears on the AMC 10. And this is from the 2017 AMC 12B. So we have that let n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, all the way to 43, 44. So it's just all the natural numbers from 1 to 44 in order, and they're just combined. What is your remainder when n is divided by 45? So I've removed the choices here because we don't want to just guess the answer to this problem. Let's try to solve it. On the real test, though, it'll be a bit easier because you'll have choices. So what is the remainder when n is divided by 45? Well, using the Chinese remainder theorem, 
First of all, we're asked, what is this number? What is n mod 30 uh, mod 45? So using the Chinese remainder theorem, we know that we can find it. We can find what n is mod five and mod nine. And that will give us a unique solution mod 45. And we can just find that once we know what it is mod five and mod nine. It's very hard to find a number mod 45, but it's easier to find a number mod five and mod nine. So the, a number mod five, well, that's just, you look at the last digit and you see how much greater it is than zero or five. The last digit here is four. So it's four greater than a multiple of four, a uh, multiple of five. So that means it's equal to four mod five. Mod nine is a bit trickier. Recall that to find if a number is divisible by nine, you add up all the digits and you find the remain, or you divide that by nine. And that's how you know if a number is divisible by nine. So let's look at 10, for example, 10 mod nine is equal to one. If I found the sum of the digits of 10, which is one plus zero, that gives me one. So we won't attempt to prove this year, but logically, intuitively, this might make sense to you is that if you find the sum of the digits of a number, you can take that mod nine to find the remainder, right? If it's zero mod nine, that means that that number is divisible by nine. So what is the sum of the digits of this number? Well, the sum of the digits of this number, scroll down. Okay. Well, that's going to be, let's, let's find it. So there's the digits one through nine and they appear once in the zeros in the tens. They appear another time in the twenties. They appear another time in the thirties. They appear another time. And then in the forties, we have the digits zero, one, two, three, and four that appear. Now we also have 10 ones that appear 10 twenties, 10 threes. So this should be 10. And how many fives do we have? We have five fives, zero, one, two, three, four. Okay. Let's find the sum. The sum of one through nine is nine times 10 divided by two or 45. So it's equal to 45 and we have this four times. So 45 times four, that gives us 180. Well, we're asked to find it mod nine. So we can discard 180 since that's um, equal to zero mod nine. Okay. So how many ones are there? There's 10 ones and their sum is 10, then 10, 20. So 20 plus 10 thirties, uh, 10 threes, which gives us 30. And then plus how many fives are there? There's five fives. So that gives us 20. And then what else do we have? we have that uh, zero, one, two, three, and four. So that gives us another 10. So 30 plus 20 plus 20, 70 plus 10 plus 10 gives us 90. So that means that 90 is divisible by nine. So that our answer is actually divisible by nine, which means it's zero mod nine. So our answer is zero mod nine. So it's zero mod nine, four mod five. So let's start listing out the options. 0, 9, 18, and 27, and we would keep on going. So this is, uh, what would be the options for four mode mod five? That would be four, nine, 13. Oh, wait a second. Oh, this should be 14. Four, nine, 14, but wait a second. Nine and nine. So that means that nine mod 45 is our unique solution. So what is the remainder when n is divided, divided by 45? Well, that is just nine. Our last topic for the day is Diophantine equations. And when you hear that word, you want to think integer solutions. So equations that have integer solutions would be considered Diophantine equations. So we don't have time left over to do too many problems here, but let's end our class with one problem from the 2020 Amy one test. Find the number of ordered pairs of positive integers M and N such that M squared N equals 20 to the power of 20. So this is a Diophantine equation because we're asked to find the integer solutions. The thing about Diophantine equations is that a lot of the times they're based on number theory instead of algebra because there's some number logic that you need to apply. Here, when I see this problem, my first thought is that if I isolate n, I get that n is equal to 20 squared, uh, 20 to the power of 20 over m squared, which means that if I have some value of m, then when I plug in the value of M here, the value of N is going to be fixed. 
right? So if you were to replace this with some number b, if b equals m squared, then 20 to the power of 20 over b, that's equal to n. So that means that for each value of b or each value of m squared, the value of n is fixed and there's only one possible value. So this problem, it's basically asking for how many perfect squares are factors of 20 to the power of 20, because we want m squared to be a factor of 20 to the power of 20, and n squared is a perfect square since m is an integer. So that means, let's find the prime factorization of 20 first. So 20 to the power of 20 equals 2 squared to the power of 20 times 5 squared, or not 5 squared, just 5 to the power of 20 or 2 to the power of 40 times 5 to the power of 20. Okay, so for a number to be a perfect square, for a factor to be a perfect square, it has to have even powers of all the exponents that it has. So for our number, for the value of m that we choose, m squared, the value that we choose, it needs to have an even power of 2. So there's 21 options for that since you could have 0, 2, all the way to 40. Uh, so there's 20 positive integers and then 2 to the power of 0 gives us one more option. So there's 21 options here. And then for 5 to the power of 20, you could have 0, 2, 4, all the way to 18 and 20. So there's 11 options there. So the number of ways to pick m squared gives us 231. And each of those values is going to give us one unique m. Remember, the negative answer doesn't count since it says positive and it's going to give us a unique value of n. So there's 231 possible ordered pairs. So our answer is 231, and that's it. We just solved an Amy problem. Thank you for attending today's session. Homework is available at thepuzzler.com slash courses slash amc-10 crash course, and it consists of AMC problems containing topics in class. A lot of the stuff that we weren't able to cover in class today due to time constraints will be found in the handout for this week on that same exact link. Please don't forget to give this video a like if you have not already. If you have any questions, feel free to write them in the video comments and we'll, get, we'll try our best to get to them as quick as possible. Thank you everyone.